Hi everyone and welcome to the October 2000 edition of Wavelength. Well, these are scenes from the Powder River Basin in Wyoming where more than six and a half million tons of coal are mined each year and then loaded onto trains headed for the Fayette Power Project. That's more than one train every single day, more than 500 trains in a given year. The 2,000 mile journey takes place 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Each year the fleet delivers a steady supply of coal that is stockpiled and then burned in units one, two, and three. The arrival of 135 brand spanking new aluminum coal cars on Tuesday, September 26th was big news for people at FPP and LCRA's rail car maintenance shop. These are uh, what's known as a twin tub car. Now our old cars, uh, both the steel and aluminum cars, were known as flat bottom gondolas. So the, the floor of the car was flat. And each of these cars uh, actually have a tub that hangs down on either side of the center sill, which does a couple of things. It increases the capacity of the car, and it also lowers the center of gravity, which makes the cars ride a little smoother. The new cars will carry 120 tons of coal each, 20 tons more than the old ones. The new $7.3 million train represents another joint venture between the LCRA and Austin Energy. Two-thirds of the cost of the new train was split between Austin Energy and the LCRA. Those 90 rail cars will service FPP units one and two. The other 45 cars are solely owned by the LCRA and will service unit three. Well, when we started looking into uh, needing more equipment and more capacity, we looked at all the options and we looked at uh, long-term lease and we looked at uh, purchasing used cars and we also looked at purchasing the new high capacity set and uh, this was the best option out of all of those. So yeah, it'll, it'll save LCRA a lot of money over the, over the life of the, of the train. Although the arrival of the new rail cars came and went without a lot of fanfare, it is a big step towards ensuring all three units at the Fayette Power Project will continue to receive a steady supply of fuel and that's good news for customers. LCRA has formed a new partnership with American Electric Power Company to construct a 150 mile long high voltage transmission line in West Texas. Now AEP is one of the largest generators of electricity in the nation and operates the world's most extensive high voltage network. The new 345 kV line will move power from gas fired plants in the Permian Basin and from the wind plants in West Texas to other parts of the state. This will increase reliability and help meet growing electrical demand. The AEP LCRA segment of the line will run from Mitchell County 150 miles to Brown County and will cost $90 million to build. Uh, this is really a big step for us. Um, not only will we be stepping up and financing that, owning it and doing all that it means to be an owner, but we also have an opportunity to learn some things from our partner uh, AEP and West Texas Utilities in terms of how they conduct their transmission business, how they do maintenance. And so we see it also as an opportunity for us to learn some new things to get ready for future growth of continuing to provide and expand our transmission services. This project will be a major step towards LCRA becoming a statewide provider of transmission services. It's been a long time since things looked like this on Lake Travis. A view of Mansfield Dam reveals just how far the water levels have dropped. These iron gates that keep trash from ruining the turbine generators and from clogging the floodgates are usually 20 feet underwater. Day by day, the lake is beginning to look more like a river, more like it did hundreds and thousands of years ago, long before the lake was even dreamed of. We're here on a, a tributary creek of Colorado River, the upper end of Lake Travis. Normally, uh, this creek is uh, about, the water's about 12 feet higher. But the low lake level is good news for at least one man, LCRA archeologist Dan Prickle. Well, archeologists often walk these dry creek beds looking <clears throat> into the banks to look for buried archeological materials left by uh, prehistoric people who are the ancestors of the people we know as the American Indians. 
It is Prickle's job to watch over the hundreds of archaeological treasures that are spread throughout the LCRA service area. Up and down this creek there are numerous prehistoric and historic period archaeological sites. Archaeologists hypothesize that as early as 9,000 years ago, the first American Indians began moving into this area, and that by 4,000 years ago, there were large numbers of tribes that were inhabiting this area. Why? Well, the river banks made a great place to camp. They were safe from the floods that came through up above. There was an adequate supply of spring water nearby, and there was plenty of game. Even buffalo roamed this area, and there always seemed to be a cool breeze, even in the dead of the summer. With all of those great assets, this was a tremendously popular place, and therefore, there are a large number of artifacts and important features to this area that are extremely valuable to archaeologists. We're looking here at uh, a cut bank along the creek. Uh, normally, this area is inundated by Lake Travis up to, over the top of the bank and, and outward that way. And what you can see here are numerous limestone rocks. Many of them have been um, burned and, and turned gray and black. Others have, have kind of a reddish tinge to them. And you can see right here the outline of a basin-shaped feature that represents a, a cooking hearth. We know from diagnostic artifacts that we have found in this vicinity that this feature probably dates somewhere between about 1200 and 1500 A.D. While it is natural for people to explore parts of the lake that are normally underwater, there is a difference between someone who stumbles upon an arrowhead and someone who digs for treasures. At the same time these archaeological sites are being exposed, they're now becoming the targets of vandals. And uh, often we get to one of these places uh, where we find these prehistoric remains and we find that someone has beat us there. The message that we want to convey is that the people who are digging into these sites and collecting the artifacts are ruining the scientific potential of these archaeological sites. Although it is a violation of the law to knowingly disrupt an archaeological site, Prickle hopes that by educating people about the importance of the sites, that they will respect their historical importance. With Lake Travis being at its lowest level in 16 years, historical sites aren't the only things being exposed. The sometimes islands in the lake's main basin are now full-time islands and growing larger every week. Marinas on Lake Travis have been chasing the receding water levels all summer, moving further and further out into the lake. As the water level drops, many long submerged items begin to reach the surface, posing boating and swimming hazards, plus they just look bad. In mid-September, the LCRA kicked off a campaign to clean up these large items with barges and cranes. The type of things that we're picking up, cars, boats, old docks, 55 gallon barrels that were used for floats, barrels that are full of concrete that were used for anchors that have been abandoned. Those are the kind of things we're after on this, this particular part of the cleanup. In August, the LCRA Board of Directors voted unanimously to spend $200,000 to remove these hazards in the lower portion of Lake Travis from Mansfield Dam upstream to the Lakeway area. We thought, well, we have a flip side situation here. We've got the reverse. We have a drought and we are also seeing a huge debris and trash problem. Let's see if we can't take those funds that are earmarked for flooding events and, and use it to clean up in this drought. LCRA crews and contractors will continue to remove this debris from Lake Travis through mid-October when there will be a very special cleanup finale. October the 14th has been identified as a volunteer day and it will combine the shoreline cleanups that we have done in the past along with the underwater dive cleanup that we've also done for six years now. Bottom line is this will be the most comprehensive lake cleanup that LCRA has done uh, ever. This is what we're about. LCRA is about taking care of our community and it's part of our community. How many great leaders throughout history actually chose that leadership role? and how many were thrown into leadership by circumstance? Are great leaders born or made? Most experts agree that even the best leaders among us can improve their leadership and communication skills with proper training. Well, everybody knows 
How many of you know who... These 80 high school sophomores and juniors from Bastrop Independent School District are being given such a leadership training opportunity today at LCRA's John Ben Shepherd Student Leadership Forum held in Smithville. It's a one-day event designed to inspire these future leaders in these communities to become involved in civic um, events, public affairs, community issues right now at an early age. We want them starting today. We're going to identify one goal and work on that goal as a team. Students are broken into groups, each headed by a pair of volunteers. They engage in activities and discussions about various styles and characteristics of leadership. They learn about various methods of communication. Students also learn about goal setting, and as a group, they actually plan a community service project, such as cleaning up a park or holding a fundraiser for a local charity. Try to get all of our school involved in recycling because well, none of us do that right now, so that's what we're gonna do. All right. <laughs> what does it mean to be a leader? Bastrop County Judge Ronnie McDonald was the featured luncheon speaker. The greatest leader to ever walk this planet came as a servant, saying, how can I serve you? And that's what made him great. And we know what happened. When you start doing it, everybody's not going to like you for doing that. They're going to talk about you. Why are you hanging around with him? Why are you hanging around? They're going to do all those bad things. But a true leader, he's not worried about lifting up the people who are already there. He's saying, man, let me talk to the people that no one else is talking to. Let me get with them. Let me encourage them. Let me lift them up. This is the first of 20 leadership forums that the LCRA will be holding this school year involving 90 school districts and some 2,000 students. We have some young individuals today that I'm seeing this leadership skills starting to be instilled in them and the confidence being built in, inside of them that they wouldn't have or they might be the kind of person that's a little bit shy that would be standing back and now they're going to have this confidence. The more education you can get in being a leader, the more learning you can obtain, the better off you are. And I come from a small community, we're growing and so we need more youth active, active in the community. We need more community service projects going on. So this will really help all of us going back home. And I would encourage you to, to be involved in your communities, be involved in the area. Blue Bonnet Electric Co-op was a co-sponsor of this forum. Guadalupe Valley Electric Co-op and Fayette Electric Co-op will also co-sponsor the student leadership forums to be held in their communities. Starting this year, the LCRA is offering two of its annual scholarships to students who have attended these leadership forums. This month on Board Profile, meet Bob Lambert from Llano County. Bob Lambert was appointed to the LCRA Board of Directors by Governor Bush in February 1999. He currently serves as chair of the Finance Committee. Bob and his wife Linda live in Horseshoe Bay on beautiful Lake LBJ. Bob is a CPA and worked for the firm KPMG Pete Marwick for 31 years. He was a full partner when he retired in 1998. When they returned to their home state of Texas three years ago, Bob was hoping to find a way to give something back to Texas. That's when he got the call to serve on the LCRA board. He is busier, certainly, but he's really enjoying every minute of his work with the LCRA. And uh, I'd say it's enhanced both of our lives here. Uh, he's not only learning a lot, but just enjoying every, every uh, facet of his work with the LCRA. Bob and Linda live, as he says, just a driver away from the Ferguson power plant. I live 200 yards away and uh, it's just amazing. You can never hear a thing from this power plant. I mean, it's uh, it's like, like you don't exist at times. So Director well, Lambert stopped by the Ferguson plant recently to visit with employees and see some of the new digital equipment in the control room. The electric side is very important to LCR. It's a huge source of revenue. I mean, $500 million and, 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 and indirectly funds many, many activities. Uh, and it's very important to all the communities. It provides a lot of jobs. And uh, I mean, even in the middle of the resort, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's very, we're very glad uh, Ferguson Power Plant's here.
Now this, this is running all the time, isn't it? Yes, you know. After all of his years of analyzing and auditing hundreds of the top companies in the world, I asked Director Lambert what he thought of the LCRA from a financial perspective. First, LCRA is a big business. Um, got a lot of aspects to it, $500 million in revenue, $2 billion balance sheet. I mean, it's a very substantial business. Uh, I, I try to stay out of it. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to be a director, not a chief financial officer. The financial people at LCRA are very good. Uh, you know, obviously read and studied the financial statements and, and met with them, but I've got a lot of confidence in them. I stay involved. I'm chairman of the finance committee of the board, so, so I'm involved in that aspect. His message to LCRA employees reflects our core mission of serving the public. I think it's always important to remember that uh, public trust and confidence is imperative in, uh, in the life of the LCRA. Uh, I think we've got it uh, big time right now, but uh, it's kind of fragile. You never know. So uh, I'd always bear that in mind, but uh, all the people that I've met have just been very pleasant, uh, seemingly very, very qualified as well. Since retiring, Bob has taken up golf, and he teaches a course in the Graduate School of Business at the University of Texas. Director Lambert's term on the LCRA board will expire in February 2005. Low levels in area lakes are revealing some things that had been underwater for several years. Today, the Lower Colorado River Authority began taking advantage of the low water. And as Fox 7's photojournalist Steve Davis shows us, they're taking the opportunity to get that stuff up that's been stuck on the bottom of the lake floor. We're taking advantage of the opportunity to uh, pick up some heavy debris and, and larger items that have been exposed now that the water's come down. I think this is an important body of water for all of Central Texas, you know, not only Austin, but all the way down to the coast. And, uh, you know, how do you describe making it any better than just clean water? And that's what, we're, that's what we're about. So we're picking up a lot of iron, a lot of steel. We're picking up some cars. The cars have been here a long time, and I assume they were washed in during the floods. Basically, we're trying to pick up everything that was man-made or left here by man. There'll be a work barge. And on that work barge will be a crane, and uh, they'll go in and they'll actually put straps on the uh, car, and they'll lift it up out of the water and, and swing it over and, and put it on their uh, trash barge to haul back over to the shore. I think, I think we all own this lake. This lake belongs to the state of Texas, and we are owners of this lake. And so I would urge people to use it like they would, it was personally theirs. Pick up their trash, just simple things like that, you know. If you don't throw things overboard, take care of the lake. That's what mom said, yeah, yeah. If you bring it, take it back with you. Before the Longhorn Pipeline to go, it needs one signature. And Texas Land Commissioner David Dewhurst isn't lifting his pen just yet. Thanks for watching KV24 News at 10. I'm Judy Maggio. Dewhurst spent the day picking the brains of safety experts and pipeline companies. He's trying to get a handle on the risk of pumping gasoline from Houston to El Paso through Austin. KV24's Michelle Levy joins us now. Michelle, what's the conclusion? Well, Judy, Dewhurst says he likes the idea of a pipeline. In fact, he calls it the safest way to carry gasoline, but he questions how well federal safety standards are enforced, a fear echoed throughout Austin and heard loudest by those who live near the pipeline. I view it as like uh, having a 500 pound bomb in your backyard. A 500 pound bomb, Ken Howard says, could be ignited by the big business of pumping gasoline under his house. If uh, it just exploded, it'd probably take, take out the whole street. So either way, you know, it's, it's very dangerous. It's, it's like putting napalm in the backyard. Ken isn't the only one questioning the safety of pumping gasoline through Austin. So is the state's land commissioner. But I'm not yet convinced that all of the applicable federal health and safety standards have been met. And until they're met, out of clear conscience, I cannot sign an easement. The Lower Colorado River Authority worries less about an explosion and more about leaks from a pipeline that's 50 years old. But large spills happen with pipelines. They happen with older pipelines, hence our concern. Um, and we see no reason why you don't replace obsolete equipment and technology when there's a potential to ruin that much water. Longhorn says it understands the concerns of the people who live along the pipeline. And to quiet some of their fears, they're committed to doing a weekly inspection 
to troubleshoot any problems. We're going to uh, we're going to find anything that's corroded. We're going to find anything that's weakened, and we're going to replace it. The pipeline has existed for 50 years, but segments of the pipeline are replaced all the time. But that's little comfort to Ken Howard. If the gas comes through, he says he'll go. I'm thinking very seriously of selling my house. I don't really want to. I was one of the first people on the street. And uh, we've been here 25 years. Not everyone is as worried as Ken Howard. We talked with one guy whose house is next to the pipeline, and he says he supports the idea and thinks it should have been done long ago. Judy? Now, Michelle, at one point, the city was against this pipeline, even filed a lawsuit. Has that changed? Well, I talked with the city attorney today. He says he's still reviewing the impact that pipeline would have, and the door is still open to refile another lawsuit to stop that pipeline if necessary.